Okay. It's okay. Working. It's working. It's working. Well, live and in studio. Live and in studio. Hi. Hi. Welcome. Welcome. To, to Misfits and Tidbits. Misfits and Tidbits. Apparently, it's just going to be an echoing podcast today. No. <laughs> uh, hello. Sorry. I think, I, I think we could I, just... I feel. I feel awkward. Let me establish that part. Sorry. <laughs> Hold on. Okay. Now I'm ready to go. Let's, uh. Yeah, Finn, you're part of it too. Crack into it. Nice. <laughs> okay. Uh, welcome to Misfits and Tibbets. We are the podcast where Junie is going to be telling. I'm Junie. That's Junie. This is this is Junie. I'm Ethan, and they're going to be telling me about why Finn won't stop barking. Shut the fuck up. He's he's barking a lot. You think he's sad? No, I think he's I think he's defensive. I think that he or protective. I guess it's a better word for it. I think. Territorial. Territorial. Okay. Um, well, Junie will be um, learning us, dumb folk, about something new. Yes. And, and I mean, it's not new. It's old, and it's so well, fucking crazy. I mean, something new that we haven't learned. You know, yes. not like it's not a new thing. Yes. Um, but you have been very excited about this one this week. Yeah. And you've been dying to tell me all about it. I have. And I've been dying to know what it is. All right. Uh, before I tell you, I'm just going to give my disclaimer. I do have like a little bit of like a more disclaimer part to this one. Um, if I get anything wrong or if I miss anything super important to this story, please feel free to email us at hello at mntpodcast.com and let me know. Um, but this story or this uh, topic is very full of um, like examples and and. Um, I guess we'll just, like, as soon as we get into it, you'll know. But, like, I didn't cover every square inch of this just because it is such a big topic. I did a lot, and, like, I feel like I put enough in it for you to realize how absolutely insane it is. Okay. Um, but there are more parts to it. So you can, if, you know, if you're interested, I have a book that you can go read and just a bunch of stuff um, to do a, a little bit of additional research on this. But. Very cool. Today, we're going to be learning about. Oh, wait. Wait, sorry. Nothing, apparently. We're going to be learning about something. <laughs> but uh, just a quick little new thing. At the end of this oh, yeah. at the end of this episode, we're going to have a new little segment that is yet to be named. We have not ultimately decided on what it's named yet. If you come up with a name, though, feel free to email us at hello at mntpodcast.com just in case you come up with super, something super clever. Would love the help. But I will be sharing a small little fun um, tidbit that I learned about that uh, just on something that I was curious about, you know? So every every week, I think, we'll have something new. Just a small fun thing, maybe a little palate cleanser if we have a heavy topic or something like that. But um, it'll just be a little fun um, tidbit for you to take home and share with the f- folks, the folks at home. Now, what are we learning this week? This week, we're going to be learning about Henrietta Lacks. Who? My thought exactly, which is like <laughs> such a rough thing like it's so the whole point of this is that like she's not known like that yeah. is like what's so fucked up about this story is that she, like she's really not talked about at all mm-hmm. um but I didn't know about her and I was having coffee with my friend over <laughs> zoom <laughs> and uh she was telling me that she has like a bunch of topics in mind and stuff and I told her that we're doing like black history month we're focusing on um just topics about black history um specifically in America and she was like oh I'm assuming you've done Henrietta Lacks and I was just like who <laughs> um and she told me about this book called the immortal life of henrietta Lacks. it's by an author named rebecca Skloot, and she played a big role in the um like disclose disclosure of information about henrietta Lacks because prior to that like basically nobody knew her and her book was actually at the top of the new york times bestseller list for six years um, and it helps give a lot of attention to this, but I, like, because of how insanely intense the story is, I could not believe that I didn't know who she was. 
Um, so I'm super excited to be able to tell you about it today. Well, it sounds um, very exciting. So I'm, yeah. I'm very excited to hear about this exciting story. All right. So my sources this week were Hopkins Medicine, The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks on HBO. The It's a dramatization of the book written about her, um, Wikipedia, Nature.com, and then I did also grab information from the Henrietta Lacks Foundation website. So. Sweet. Um, this is the only picture that I have for the entire episode because there are a few names and stuff that are mentioned in here. But since it's such an, it's an unknown... It's about her. Yeah. But it's, it's also a very unknown thing, so I doubt there's a lot of... Um, I mean, like, all of her... Now it's, like, way known. It's really popular. Yeah. Like, there are her pictures of her doctors, but her doctors, like, fuck those dudes. So, um, yeah. I'm sure we'll learn about where that animosity yeah. comes from. Yeah. And it's not about Rebecca Sloot, so I didn't, inf- like, include a picture of her. Got it. It's can not about inc- her. Can we include a picture of the book? Uh, Yeah. I mean, you don't need to pull it up. I, I yeah, know. but this is this is her. Um, super lovely, super wonderful. I have a lot of really wonderful, like, heartfelt tidbits about her that we'll get into, but I am going to first tell you all about her. How do you spell her name? Henrietta, as in how exactly you'd think you'd spell Henrietta, and then Lax, L-A-C-K-S. That is not how I thought the last name was. Same. Yeah. Yeah, because, yeah, this was a, it was a verbal, um exchange of information when I was figuring out who she was, so I didn't think that either, but, um, yeah, so. Let's get into the story. Yeah. Henrietta Lacks was born on August 1st, 1920. Uh, Her birth name was Loretta Pleasant, and she was born in Roanoke, Roanoke, Virginia, to Eliza Pleasant, whose maiden name was Lacks, and John Johnny Randall Pleasant. It's not clear how she became or how she started being called Henrietta Mm because her name was Loretta, Mm -hmm. but um, she did. And like, that's what her, I don't know if it was like legal name was changed to that, but like, that's why she's famous is because like in her medical records, her name's Henrietta Lacks and we'll get into that. But uh, her nickname was Henny, which was just really sweet in the movie to like hear people reflect like so fondly on her and call her Henny. Her mother died giving birth to her 10th child. So she was one of 10 kids. Um, And uh, because of which her father moved the family of 10 children and himself to Clover, Virginia, and then distributed the kids among relatives that lived in Clover. So Henrietta went to live with her mom's dad, who was Thomas Tommy Henry Lex in a two-story log cabin that was once slave quarters on the plantation that had been owned by Henrietta's white great-grandfather and great-uncle. Jeez. Yeah. So, they're African-Americans whose, like, descendants were slave owners who owned a plantation on which now they live as, yeah, like, descendants from slaves, which is so wild. Yeah. Um, And when she moved to this excuse me, this, like, farm plantation, she shared a room with her cousin and her future husband, David Day Lax. Got it. Which, I didn't look into this, and I don't think that it's anything weird, but does that mean that they're related? That's what I was wondering, because her... Mom's maiden name was Lax. Lax. And then her married name was Lax, and she met a Day going back to live with family, so... Hmm. Yeah, so I'm not sure, but no. yeah. Um, Henrietta Lax worked as a tobacco farmer, and her husband said that even when she was pregnant, she would go to work as a tobacco farmer in Clover, and she just, she loved Clover. She gave birth to her son, Lawrence Lax, in 1935 at the age of 14. Lawrence Lax. Yes. That's that's a name for a storybook. Yes. She was 14. <laughs> <laughs> Just don't want to miss that part. <laughs> no, I got that. And then she gave birth to her daughter, Elsie Lax, in 1939. Um, Elsie had developmental issues, and she was said to have been epileptic and suffered from neurosyphilis, which is an infection of the central nervous system in a patient with syphilis. Excuse me. Um, it is, like, believed that... Oh, and it was obviously genetic... That or hereditary, I don't know what the difference between those two things are, but like the daughter got syphilis from like the parent, and it was found out later that Henrietta had HIV 
PV. I don't know what the difference is, but I do tell you exactly which one it was. So that, like, when I was first reading about Elsie and how she had these developmental issues and it was because of her neurosyphilis, I was just like, oh, that means that, like, Henrietta had to have had something. And then later on in the in her research, I found out that she did. So... She, uh, Elsie Wax, was ultimately placed in the hospital for Negro for the Negro Insane of Maryland, which was later named to Crownsville Hospital Center in 1950 when Elsie was 11. Um, and she ended up dying in the hospital at the age of 15 in 1955. And uh, it was learned later that Elsie had been abused and may have had holes drilled in her head during experimental treatments, including pneumoencephalography. Which is? It is the practice, basically, by which they do x-rays, and why they drill holes in your head is to drain the fluid from your brain so it's easier to take x-rays. So. Seems smart. I think they pump air in. So they take the fluid out and they pump air in. Is that... that that doesn't sound good for you. No, it did not. But yeah, so, so she, yeah, so she was subject to that and other types of just... I'm sure atrocities, unheard of things. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And um, it didn't really come out until after Henrietta died that Elsie was like, it, like under these crazy um, conditions and stuff like that. And it was like much later that um, when Rebecca was writing the book, at least this is what happened in the movie, that they went looking for Elsie to try and tell her story as well because she was kind of like the forgotten child because she was basically just locked away. But it was um, said that Henrietta was like, I think Henrietta was pregnant at the time that she went to put Elsie in the hospital Mm -hmm. and she was like ready to die. She was like, she loved Elsie so much, so... It was, like, the last thing that she wanted to do, but it was just too much for her to have to, like, she could, Elsie could not do anything for herself, so, mm-hmm. yeah, so, just really sad. Um, so, Day and Henrietta Lacks moved to Maryland in 1941 and ended up having three more children. Okay. These children were David Sonny Lacks Jr., um, and he was born in 1947, still alive today. Deborah Lax Pullum, who was born Deborah Lax, obviously, and uh, she was born in 1949 and she lived um, until 2009 when she passed away of a heart attack in her sleep. And Joseph Lax, who was born in 1950, also still alive. Um, she gave birth to Joseph four and a half months before finding out that she had cervical cancer. So after giving birth, Lax had a severe hemorrhage, which I honestly had to Google that because I didn't know exactly what that meant. Um, But it just means, like, excessive bleeding. Mm -hmm. And on January 29th, 1951, Henrietta went to Johns Hopkins, which was the only hospital in the area that treated black patients at the time. And it was because she felt a knot in her womb and was suffering from vaginal bleeding. Um, And this was something that was in the film that might not totally be true, but I don't think it's not not true. But it was speculated or rumored in the community that Johns Hopkins ran experiments on black people. They're just like without their consent. Got it. Um, So there, her primary care doctor tested her for syphilis, which came back negative. So she got recommended to come back to Johns Hopkins and then saw Dr. Howard W. Jones, who took a biopsy of a mass found on Lax's cervix. (laughs) Go ahead. ahead. You're fine. So, um... I think she found the bump, at least in the movie, and I know that this is, um, like, me referencing the movie. It, 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 I'm hoping it is factual um, for the stuff that was, you know, supposed to be based on fact. But she, like, felt it first and then went in and was like, you know, like, there's there's an actual... There's, I feel like there's reason for me to be super concerned about this mass on me. And so she went in and they took a biopsy of it. And she was then told that she had a cancerous epidermoid carcinoma of the cervix. Which basically just meant she had cancer cells on her cervix. Mm -hmm. But uh, that was a misdiagnosis, and she actually had an adenocarcinoma, which instead of just saying you have cancer in your cervix, it was you have a tumor, a cancerous tumor in your cervix. Got it. Um, But it was a common misdiagnosis, and the treatment would have been the same, so not too big of a deal. Either way, you have cancer, and we have to treat you for it. Yeah. So the way that she was treated for this cancer was with radium tube inserts, 
which is basically exactly what it sounds like. They're sealed tube inserts that go inside you and they are a radiation source. So they basically put tubes of radiation up inside her to try and like give local radiation to the cancerous cells. That sounds horrible. Yeah. And it was, it was not pleasant. It was painful. It was horrible. Like it was not a fun experience to have. Um, During her treatments, two samples were taken from her cervix without her permission or knowledge, and one sample was of healthy tissue and the other was cancerous. Um, Samples were given to George Otto Guy, a physician and cancer researcher at Johns Hopkins. Again, without her knowledge or consent. Okay. So neither Henrietta Lax or her family gave... physicians permission to harvest her cells but they did anyway so for decades scientists had collected tissue samples from patients without their consent so it was a normal thing um they were looking for cells that could live outside of the human body and the reason why that they would do this is because they would like to be able to perform experiments on cells without having to do it on a human being so that they could test the conditions under which cells can survive and just a bunch of other stuff at different applications uh, Guy observed that the cells that were taken from Henrietta were unusual and that they reproduced at a very high rate and could be kept alive long enough to allow for more in-depth examination. Whereas other cells that had been taken kind of under similar circumstances would die within a few days. Hers completely just would, it said right here, black cells doubled every 20 to 24 hours, whereas other cells would die within a few days. Got it. So then it was distributed to labs around the world. And by distributed, as soon as cells could reprodu- like were reproducing, they had enough um, quantity to be able to distribute, they were selling them and profiting off of her cells. Johns Hopkins was. Yeah. Not anybody else <laughs> selling yeah. her cells for research. So, you know, it's like obviously they're trying to do good and, and help yeah, other people. Yeah, but it's not that the they're just fun. doing the research. They're profiting off it yeah. without, without her knowing, without... Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. If it was just in the name of research and no one was making money off it, then like Mm -hmm. that's one thing. It's still not great that they did it without telling her, but yeah. But yeah, they were to make money off of it. Yep. Yeah. Um, and in the movie, I don't know if this is true, but there was a, um, like someone in the family had a family friend who she met who worked at a lab in just a hospital in the city that they lived. And he told her that, He was actually, like, experimenting with her cells, but any time that they would run out or whatever, all he had to do was order more, and they would send more. Like, he would buy more from them, and she she found out, like, just... I don't think he knew that Henrietta was, like, a part of their family. He just was saying that he was able to do this, like, you know, wonderful experimentation with these cells that he was just buying from Johns Hopkins. Yeah. So, again, I don't know if that was just, um... What is it called? Uh... I don't know. I don't know if that was falsified for the sake of the story of the movie or if that's true. Yeah, but either way. And it, no, editorialized is what I was looking for. Editorialized. But, um, yeah, so, super fucked up. But. What's the difference between drama, dramatization and ed- editorialization? I don't know, and I don't even think that my word was right. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay uh, but it is the word i was looking for oh okay yeah and so yeah i think like dramatization well kind of i feel like dramatization is like isn't it like it's not even falsifying but it's for the sake of drama they like right it's like i, I mean that's what it's in the name but all yeah, but but editorializing it, is basically like um say that an article is written and it it communicates a specific message if you say, yeah, the article said this specific message, but with totally different wording, you're, like, editorializing. Or, like, you're saying that they said something that they didn't really say, but they, they effectively said it. So when you say, Got like, it. when, you know, um, if I were to talk about the family and how they didn't want her cells to be distributed without, A, without her consent, and B, without being compensated for it, I could tell you that they were like, yeah, they were like, fuck no. Absolutely, you can't do that. That's editorializing because they didn't actually say that. I don't know that they said that, but yeah. you understand that the message is being communicated. But dramatization is not just retelling something. It's um, I'm not saying what you're doing is. I was just trying to get the difference Isn't it? between between them. 
dramatization is not that though. Dramatization they can they can build off of the truth with like other things or just rewrite it a little bit to make it more, you know. Dramatic. I feel like they effectively do the same thing but have differences, yeah. And I yeah. do think that dramatization is the right word for what I was trying to I think to dramatization say. implies that it's um, somewhat like romanticized or like false. Yeah. And editorializing is probably just re it's kind of like exaggerating. Rephrasing. Yeah, it. yeah. Yeah. And yeah. dramatization is exaggerating it. It's like yeah. making it so that it makes for a better story rather than just rewording or re- rephrasing what actually happened. So hey. after this super unnecessary semantic conversation, I want to tell you a huge, unbelievable fact of nature. Nature? Yeah. Nature? Nature? This was the first cell line in over 30 years of this attempt of scientists taking cells without their patient's consent that cells could survive and reproduce indefinitely outside the body. They were dubbed immortal because they could continuously reproduce and they would never die because they aren't dying. They're just they're constantly yeah. multiplying. Um, and they ended up being called Gila for Henrietta Lacks Gila. Um, and it's the oldest human cell line and most commonly used cell line in biomedical research today. Wow. She got cancer, or she was diagnosed with cancer, and this biopsy was taken in 1951. It and they're, is they're still using the cells. Same cells. Well, I mean, not those they're exact ones. They're reproducing. They're yeah. still using the same strain, like the same family of cells that has been reproducing. And it's the most commonly used. Like they are, there have been cell lines since that have been taken and are able to survive outside of the human body, but hers are like the most commonly used still. Is that where osmosis Jones came from? No. It's a family of cells. <laughs> <laughs> so I now have a section called why this is fucked. <laughs> So it's just going to kind of go into the... Tell me more. The, like, like the racial disparities and how the family was exploited and she was exploited and all this stuff. So as stated above, she nor her family gave consent for her cells to be taken. And although it was typical, permission wasn't required and it wasn't usually sought, but it was just one of many examples of the lack of informed consent in the 20th century of medicine. Yeah. Her family also had no access to her patient files and had no say in who received HeLa cells or what they would be used for. Um, they ended up being used for medical research and for commercial purposes. So not only were they used in biomedical research, but also, like I said, they were being sold. Mm-hmm. Excuse me. On top of that, even as HeLa cells began to gain attention and use throughout the scientific community, Relatives didn't receive any of the financial benefit and had limited access to health care as they were black. So they didn't have access to the health care that white people did. They were like, you know, there was still segregation and all that stuff that they were subject to. Yeah. And yeah, just really fucked up. And um, this is another super shitty thing. But when the name of the cells became known as Kila, Johns Hopkins said that they were from a present of uh, excuse me, a patient named Helen Lane to make it seem as though they came from a white lady instead of from Henrietta Lacks. Yeah. That's fucked up. Yeah. Super fucked up. Um, there was a case taken to the Supreme Court of California in 1990 called Moore versus Regents of the University of California, which was determined, uh, which was to determine who owns tissue samples taken for the purposes of research. So this is not, it has nothing to do with Henrietta Lacks, but in 1976, John Moore was treated for hairy cell leukemia by by physician David Gold at the UCLA Medical Center. Moore's cancer cells were later developed into a cell line that was commercialized by Gold and UCLA, but it was ruled that a person's discarded tissue and cells are not their property and can be commercialized. So. Discarded sounds like I threw it away and then you... You've happened upon it. You're like, oh, yeah. I could make money off this. It's exactly. Like, no, you, you, you got that from... I didn't, right. Well, and it's not like I wasn't going to give you my cells because I need to... Like, you're doing a biopsy of cancer, so of course I'm going to give you my cells for that purpose. Yeah, not for the purpose of anything else. Not for exactly. selling. You don't, you don't get to sell it. Right. Fucking give them back. 
<laughs> well, I mean, if they're cancerous, I don't want them back. I don't know. Throw, I, like, discard them uh, at that point. Yeah. But like discard them, discard them. Put them in a garbage sell. disposal. Um, <laughs> so yeah, lack of situation has also influenced the establishment of the common rule in 1981, which is a rule of ethics regarding biomedical and behavioral research involving human subjects. The rule enforces informed consent by ensuring that doctors inform patients if they plan to use any details of the patient's case in research and give them the choice of disclosing the details or not. So if we take cells of you and we're going to use them in research, as is apparently our right to do, Mm -hmm. we at least have to ask for your permission to disclose that they came from you for what purposes they came from you and all that stuff. But if you you don't, they still get to do what they want to do. They just can't disclose that it came from you. Mm -hmm. That's stupid. What's the point? It's to preserve privacy. Um, so it, they made it so that tissue samples are no longer identified by donors' names, but by code numbers to enforce privacy. And to further resolve the issue of a patient's privacy, John Hopkins established a joint committee with the National Institutes of Health and several of Lacks family members to determine who receives HeLa cells and Henrietta Lacks genome. Because I don't know exactly when it was, but... The family didn't even know that this was happening. They didn't know that her cells were being distributed until much later. And then, um, like, even later after that, her entire genome was published, like, publicly. So there was, you know, details about her lineage and just everything about her complete, like, DNA makeup Mm -hmm. was published. And the family was like, you can't fucking do that. Like, that's that's our DNA. Like, you're that's such an invasion. Um, so yeah, so they started this committee with the family, Johns Hopkins did, um, to determine who could have access to HeLa cells and who could view Henrietta's genome. And there's nothing, in, I, I know it's probably less important to them, but like there's nothing in, at least I like, catch anything that you said that has anything to do with them talking about like, it's all about like privacy, not nothing about like profiting off of so that's stuff. one of the things they honestly the family was not too concerned about the profit which it's like of course they should have been but like they were but more that's like a, that's what i'm saying i don't think it's as important as mm-hmm. you know the privacy they, part of it but it's like if there's going to be like a, a legal battle about it like i would think that someone would be like also what about the you know yeah i think that they were way more concerned in making sure that people Basically, the, they were, like, trying to to protect Henrietta. That was yeah. the thing. It was not in pursuit of, of like, a gain. It was really just so I know, but not protected. even, like, gain for themselves. I'm, I, I was thinking, like, uh, trying to get something, like, passed or, or some, some rules or laws or whatever that would, you know, help protect people in the future but also give them the right to you know have their cells or their 100%. dna not like monetized without them knowing or without them like that's just yeah yes. even if even if i do give you permission to disclose my information like if you're profiting off of literally something that came from me organically yeah like i deserve profit for that i gave that to you you would yeah. not have any of that success if it weren't for me yeah it just seems really weird yeah to yeah, whatever. No, I definitely agree. I do, for sure. But, and, like, I also understand the sentiment of them, but, like, yeah. fuck. That's I don't it. think the money is, like, super important. It just it just seems like if, if someone, if you're going to be doing that, then I feel like I would think that someone putting forth a legal battle would have to address that at some point, but maybe not. Yeah. I guess not. And I'm not certain that they didn't. Yeah. But that's, yeah, I just didn't put that in here because really like what the family thought was super fucked up was the privacy stuff so yeah um only after researchers published the dna sequence of the genome of a strain of hela cells um did this happen but the family had no idea until rebecca sclute the author of the immortal life of henry lax told them that her genome was published they had literally no idea and then she in her research kind of told the family because she did a bunch of research prior to talking to the family Mm -hmm. because she was just like obsessed with the case and there's so little known about it and she was like obsessed because of how much HeLa cells have done for the like the biomedical community but she started just getting just infatuated and, and just consumed by the actual story of Henrietta so she did a bunch of medical research before actually talking to the family 
And when she finally got to talk to them, she was, like, telling them all this stuff that they had no idea, like, what cells were being used for and all of this stuff. And one of them was that, yes, the DNA genome was published. So they didn't even know until she told them. Got it. Um, there is a quote by um, Locke's granddaughter um, that she said to the NYT that said, quote, the biggest concern was privacy. What information was actually going to be out there about our grandmother and what information they can obtain, obtain from her sequencing that will tell them about her children and grandchildren and going down the line. So that was Jerry Lacks Y, who is Henrietta's granddaughter. Excuse me. So yeah, just a lot of super shitty things about the fact that these cells were taken without consent and yeah. then went on to be so prolific. Mm-hmm. So, sorry. So, gosh, I honestly was like, this episode's gonna be so short. I feel like we're already almost to the end, and I still have four more pages of notes. <laughs> Chock full of information. Chock full. This was, I, yeah, I, like I said, A, enjoy doing the research for this, but B, it's so dense. It's okay, we still have two hours left on this card. <laughs> Perfect. Perfect. Yeah, we don't have to take wee breaks every 30 minutes. <laughs> yeah. I wonder if anybody's noticed that we take it like thirty every thirty minute interval. Yeah, it's a, it's a it's about it's like twenty eight minutes. Yeah. every single time. Well, because we get a two minute warning, so yeah, it's like it's like twenty eight minutes and thirty two seconds every single time. Because it takes us thirty two seconds to to figure out how to tell <laughs> people that we're gonna take a break. Yeah. Speaking of, I was just gonna say, are y'all going to take a wee break? You want to take a wee break? Perfect. Sounds great. Um, and when we come back. We're going to get into the section called What HeLa Cells Have Done for Biomedical Research. Sick. Welcome back. Welcome back. Welcome back. <laughs> so, we left off with uh, what HeLa cells have done for biomedical research. What have they done? What have you done? So, HeLa cells, in 1954, microbiological associates began selling HeLa cells, which gave birth to the biomedical industry. There are many strains of HeLa cells as they continue to mutate in cell cultures, but all HeLa cells are descended from the same tumor cells removed from lax. That's wild. So when I was, I was going to say this earlier, but like when I said that they still use the same cells, technically they are because they descended from the same cells, but they've mutated a lot since then. Yeah. Um, the total number of HeLa cells that have been propagated in cell culture far exceeds the total number of cells that were in Henrietta Lacks' entire body. That makes sense. I don't know how many, how many, let's see. Sorry. I do want to just check this real quick. What does that affect like testing and stuff? I think they probably know, like they track it. But it's it's also when the cells are cultured, so like the the base cells that are mute or that are multiplying probably are pretty pretty similar. Um, I mean that makes sense. It's fifty years of, like seventy years of. Yeah. Of cells reproducing, I'm I'm sure there's more than thirty trillion of them. Well, I don't know how many they started with. Check. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, yeah, that, but yeah, there's 30 trillion cells in, in a, a human, human body. body. Yeah. Also, that's one. That's wait, six. Twelve. That's 13 zeros. That's a lot of zeros. Looks just like my bank account. Nice. Is that a good thing? A lot of zeros, just nothing. <laughs> a lot of zeros. Zero point zero zero. Nothing in front of them, just a bunch of zeros. Um, when did she get in here? Who? <laughs> oh, the plant? Uh, when I, we were setting up everything for the shoot. Oh, shoot. Okay, cool. I just didn't realize she was in here <laughs> until I just blown my hair into her. Yeah, sorry. I thought you'd just notice. I did just notice. Well, I mean, I thought you would notice and then <laughs> either say something or not say anything, but I, I thought it would be before, you know, when you were maybe coming in here and sitting down, you would notice that there was a plant next to you. That's okay. It's okay. It's okay. No. Okay. 
Mm -hmm. all this hard work to make this a beautiful set and then it just goes unnoticed listen i sit here every freaking week it is a beautiful set anyway (laughs) um that's where we need the second camera for the close-up just the the office zoom on my face there you go i don't i don't disagree but just come on you come on Anyway, um, so HeLa cells were the first human cells to success to be successfully cloned in 1953 by Theodore Puck and Philip I. Marcus at the University of Colorado, Denver. That's where you're from. It is where I'm from, but also they cloned her cells. Yeah. Wild. In wild. 1953, which was super surprising to me. That seems so early. What is, like... What does that mean, they cloned her cells? It means they took her cells and then they made exact copies of it. (laughs) Well, yeah, but aren't like... I don't know. Maybe I just aren't... I don't know. I don't don't understand what cloning... I don't think I'm smart enough to ask the question I'm thinking about. Sorry. It's okay. (laughs) Um, Like... I don't know. I like opened a door in my head that I can't... (laughs) To a room where I'm like, what's happening in here? And I'm just picturing you floating through like the Twilight Zone space right now. Yeah, I open a door in my brain that just led me into the space, and I'm just like, uh, questions. Yeah, I got questions, but I don't even know what the questions are. That's how lost I am. All right. Anyway, that was useless. Cells were cloned in 1953. <laughs> Her cells. Uh, Hela cells have been quote con- bleep, nope they no that's not it that ain't it chief they have been quote continually been used for research into cancer AIDS the effect of radiation and toxic substances gene mapping and countless other scientific pursuits since then. It's a lot of things. Yes, so that is what I was telling you when I was saying that there's like a lot of information here that might not be here because what I did was give you so many examples of how HeLa cells were being used, but I didn't get all of them because there are so effing many. Yeah. HeLa cells were used by Jonas, wow, Jonas Salk to test the first polio vaccine in the 1950s. And this is the biggest, like when people hear about HeLa cells or Henrietta Lacks, they think polio because her cells helped Develop the vaccine for yeah. polio. So, polio myelitis is an infectious disease caused by the polio virus, and in 0.5% of cases, it moves from the gut to affect the central nervous system, and there is muscle weakness resulting in flaccid paralysis, which just means that you lose control over your limbs, typically starting in the legs, and then it could also go to like the abdomen and arms, I think is what it said. Can you see that slower? What polio is? Yeah, it's really fast. An infectious disease caused by the polio virus, Uh and in 0.5% of cases, it moves from the gut to affect the central nervous system, and there is muscle weakness resulting in flaccid paralysis. Got it. Uh, Cells were, the HeLa cells were easily infected by poliomyelitis, um, which killed the HeLa cells, which up and not up until then, but you know, they were they were rapidly reproducing and they couldn't really yeah. have been killed. They're cancerous, you know? Yeah. So yeah. Um, but this enabled Salk to test the vaccine, but he needed a large number of cells to test. So in spring of 1953, a cell culture factory was established by the National Foundation for Infantile Paralysis at Tuskegee University. To supply Salk and other labs with HeLa cells. Is it Tuskegee? Is it? I don't know. I think it's Tuskegee. Maybe. That could be right. Are we going to look up a pronunciation? Yeah. Yeah. Tuskegee. Huh. I'm going to think of a different... No, that's that's definitely the word I was thinking of, maybe. No. That doesn't look... Maybe. (laughs) Okay. I thought there was a... I thought there was an A in the... in, In my head, there was an A in it. No. Maybe it's a different place. Maybe I just made it up. I was just going to say, I think he yeah, adds a brain. I think I made it up. A place that just exists. Whatever. There. All right. Um, so, yeah. So, they built a cell culture factory just so that they could basically mass produce HeLa cells 
yeah. for different types of experimentation, but it was based on Salk's experimentation with the polio vaccine. And within a year of that establishment being opened, the polio vaccine was ready for human trials. Damn. Do you know, uh, I, I don't think you probably would have said it if you knew how, like, how many cells they, like, were able to produce in that year. Because he said he needed a lot of cells, obviously. To, yeah, but it was also wasn't just for him. It was for, it was for several, it, like, it said... Um, to supply salt and other labs with HeLa cells. It wasn't just for him. Got it. Yeah. So, um, the HeLa cells were also a significant help in studying viruses. They were used to test how parvovirus infects the cells of humans, dogs, and cats. It was used to test the Oropush virus, or OROV, which causes the disruption of cells in culture and causes programmed cell death. That's what the virus does. It was used to test uh, HPV, and have they have been instrumental in developing a vaccine. So in 1980, Harold Zerhausen found that the original cells taken from the biopsy contained HPV-18. HPV, not HIV. Um, and that was the ultimate cause of her cancer. His work in linking HPV with cervical cancer won him a Nobel Prize and led to the development of HPV vaccines that are predicted to reduce the number of deaths from cervical cancer by 70%. These cells were also used to test HIV, Zika, herpes, and mumps to develop vaccines and other drugs for these cases. HeLa cells have been used in a number of cancer studies, including those involving sex steroid hormones such as estradiol, estrogen, and estrogen receptors, along with estrogen-like compounds such as quercetin and its cancer-reducing cancer properties, excuse me. Um, so the reason why I was really focused on estrogen and sex hormones is because it was cervical cancer, and that's really what, it, what yeah. the association was there. So it was easy to test with those types of things. Um, the cells were tested excuse me, were used in tests to aid in medical diagnostics to develop um, theranostics, which is personalized medicine, and a radiation, which is just a type of radiation exposure. So basically, the cells were being put under all of this experimentation, so they would use radiation against it and see if that helped, and they would use, like, different types of personalized medicine to kill the cells or whatever, see how they would react. Yeah. So. That is kind of how they were, I mean, that's, that is how they were used. Um, but they were also used in research for photodynamic therapy to induce apoptosis, which I guess you could, I don't know exactly what photodynamic means, but it's basically a form of um, therapy to kill cells. Okay. Uh, HeLa cells have also been used to define cancer markers in RNA and have been used to establish an RNAi-based identification system and interference of specific cancer cells. Which means that because the cells had like contained DNA, they found markers on the RNA that indicated that they were cancerous. So they used those to identify in other cells if they were also cancerous. Oh. And um, yeah, and they, it was the specific type of cancer, so specific cancer cells. And it was cervical cancer, right? That they were, or what? The specific type of cancer, cervical cancer. Mm -hmm. Yes. Got it. Yep. They were also used heavily in genetics. So in 1953, a lab mistake involving mixing HeLa cells with the wrong liquid allowed research researchers to see and count each chromosome clearly in the HeLa cells they were working with for the first time. So this led scientists Joe Hin Jio and Albert uh, Levin to develop better techniques for staining and counting chromosomes. And they were eventually the first to accurately describe that humans have 23 pairs of chromosomes rather than 24, as was previously believed, which was super important for the study of developmental disorders such as Down syndrome that involve the number of chromosomes. That honestly would have bummed me out if I thought there was 24 and then I figured out there's 23. Like, the uneven number would have just... I would have quit. I'm not a doctor anymore. I'm not a scientist. I'm done. Can't deal with the uneven number. Isn't that Michael Jordan's number? It is Michael Jordan's number. <laughs> I would never disrespect Michael Jordan. You just did. No. I thought something was even the whole for for my entire you know 
career and then I found out that it wasn't I've been like you might have even said that it was pretty on <laughs> that's really good <laughs> that's the best asshole. that's the best joke of life. why do you always think I'm lying to you because the like old smileless fucking laugh the smiling. sarcastic laugh that was, that was a genuine laugh the fuck how dare you how who are you to judge what my laughs are that was a genuine I laugh heard it, you came, laugh like it came from once a week <laughs> I laugh way more than that I talk to Sergio every day he's hilarious Really sweet. You also have my face. <laughs> I would never it's say. I would never say it. I forgot you were in here. Sorry. Uh, it was a genuine laugh. It came from came from right here. No, it came from right here. It was like no, it came from right here. You were. You, you don't get to tell me where my laughs came from. For those not watching, um, go on our YouTube channel. <laughs> you can see where they're pointing. Where they're, where they're laughing. Yeah. Came from a gut. It was a gut laugh. Sus. You're sus. Tell me more. Tell me more. Like, to, to, I got nothing. Cool. So in 1965, Henry Harris and John Watkins created the first human-animal hybrid by fusing HeLa cells with mouse embryo cells. Sorry, he did what? They created a human-animal hybrid with her (laughs) cells. Mixed them with mice. Mice. Of course, it's like. <laughs> <laughs> the fuck is a hybrid animal? <laughs> <laughs> Take about hybrid cars. Um, that's fucking. What year did they do that? Fifty or sorry, not fifty. Sixty-five. Also, so fucking early. Like I cannot Wait, did they, believe. Did they create a. They didn't create like a, no. They didn't create like a they they, they hybrid cells not like they didn't, yeah they, they merged the cells they didn't like create I was like what the there's fuck a hybrid right like with a mouse. Or it wasn't a mouse with human hands. It would explain the Ninja Turtles uh, mentor. True. All right. Wasn't he a big, a big rat? It would also explain the Ninja Turtles. That's where I thought you were going with that. <laughs> I mean, it explained all the nor- ginormous humanoid creatures in the Ninja Turtle universe. Yuck. Just, like, thinking about it now, like, I think that the Megan Fox Ninja Turtles movie, the Ninja Turtles are, like, like, hyper-realistic. I, I didn't ever watch it either, but, I like, seen it either, just but thinking I... about it in my head, <laughs> thinking about hyper-realistic turtle men is yeah. so horrifying. Every time I saw it, it reminds me of, like, those hyper-realistic, like, uh, the Simpsons characters. Yeah, or, yeah, that's exactly what I was thinking Or, like, of. Spongebob when they're just, like, super grotesque and, like, but that's like realistically what it yeah, would look like. Yeah, it's so fucking gross. Ugh. Yuck. What um, was the Ninja Turtles' origin? Like in the actual story? Like why did they exist? Did they have a. Probably some radioactive waste. I don't know. That's where they all came from. That's where, that's where they always come from. There was a Rick and Morty version of that too. But I can't find it. Let's see realistic Simpsons. It's called Back to the Future. Nice. Thanks. Oh. <laughs> no. I hate that. All right. Amy Lee. Pass. Uh, oh, no, yeah. No, I'm done with that. Okay. Anyway, okay. I'm going to put all those on screen. <laughs> I'm going to remember what those were because they were disgusting. They are disgusting. Okay. So, anyway. So, yeah. Fused uh, mouse yeah. embryo cells with HeLa cells. They did not make human mice. Correct. This enabled advancements in mapping genes to specific chromosomes, which would advent- wow, which would eventually lead to the Human Genome Project, which I didn't know what that was. So, in case you're wondering what that is, you don't know. I am wondering what that is. It was- International an international research effort to determine the DNA sequence of the entire human genome, which is the complete 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 set of genetic instructions in a human. Got it. Her cells were also used in space microbiology. So in the 1960s, HeLa cells were sent on the first satellite and human space missions to determine the long-term effects of space travel on living cells and tissue. Scientists discovered that HeLa cells divided even more quickly in zero gravity. Like they, does that mean they, they, they deteriorate qu- no. quicker? They, no. They, they multiply faster. Oh. 
That's weird. Yeah, super interesting. I don't know what the like what did that what, that what actually, the application of that yeah. was. Yeah, but super weird. Also, that I mean, they can like if they were cloning, like can you grow a like human or like a can you grow like something faster in space? Gross. Like in zero, <laughs> what? No, cancer multiply. P- cancer gets worse when you go into space. Oh, don't, don't go to space. <laughs> I don't have cancer. I don't think. Not you, but I'm just saying if you have cancer, don't oh. go to space. Um, but I mean, like, if, like, say they were, like, cloning people or anything or just, like, trying to, like, organically grow things, could they go into, like, or even, I mean, I guess they could do that on Earth, like, create a zero gravity chamber or something. Can you do that? Yeah. Could, could they... It, in I don't theory. know. I I could not tell. I would say yeah, like because that's what they found. So like, yeah, they can grow it quick. So you can. What if they just grow humans like, quicker? Oh yeah. What if they just put a pregnant lady, or honestly, even something in an incubation like yeah. thing in? Is that what they did with Kyle XY? Spoilers. <laughs> <laughs> I never watched it. I don't know. He's he's like a he's a grown boy. He's not like a. You're right. He was kind of a man. He was born at seventeen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he was. Gross. All I but remember he, is that he, was, he didn't have a belly button. <laughs> because he wasn't he wasn't birthed. He didn't have like an umbilical. Right. He was grown in like a chamber, and then they, they then he was just a person. Could they do that? Or are they already doing that? They're not. No. What if they are? You don't know. This isn't saying okay. Just just no. Um. But also, <laughs> they put her cells in a nuclear bomb. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know if it was just to see if they would survive. <laughs> How would you know? <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> just put little, um, what is it called when they take your, your pulse? What? I don't know. Just like put little vital readers on each one of the cells. And then just have How, t- How tiny are these vital readers? <laughs> they're, they're cellular. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think the technology exists. <laughs> Why would they put it in a nuclear bomb? I don't know. That's what I'm saying. I have no idea. Is that like a biological weapon, technically? I'm going to be honest. That one came from the movie. So (laughs) (laughs) it might be wrong, but in the same, yeah. I'm going to need some fact checking on that one. I would love to know if they did and if they did, why? I know. I would, I think it makes sense that they might have. Why? Probably to test their resistance, but I don't know exactly yeah, how at the after yeah, after the after it's match. tested. Oh, yeah. you know. yeah. So you're telling me there's a way to survive a nuclear bomb, and they're not telling us that. <laughs> right, exactly. Maybe they found out. Exactly. It sounds like they're another another case of them throwing throwing pickles at a Burger King window. Classic. I mean, if you have access to a bomb, why not put stuff in there? You know. <laughs> yeah. Dude, there's space in here. You guys want to throw something in there? Yeah, what's some cells? I mean, I guess there's cells. Yeah, like, HeLa cells were used to learn how nuclear bombs affect humans and to study herpes, leukemia, Parkinson's disease, and AIDS. They were sent up in the first space missions to see what became of human but, cells. But, okay, they were, they were used in the testing of nukes, but were they put in the bomb? Like, what would be the purpose of putting it in a bomb? Yeah, I'm sure it was like... I'm picturing it like, let's put it inside the actual <laughs> yeah. bomb. That's what I was picturing. And why would you do that? That doesn't make any sense. Maybe it does. You know what I'm, makes sense? What if they... They had the bomb go off, and then they put the cells in the radiation area, and they would see about the radiation. That atmosphere. makes sense. Exactly. That's I'm, I'm picturing like let's put this vial of, of cells in this inside in the, the actual bomb. bomb. Yeah. <laughs> That's what I was picturing. Are you looking it up? There's a lot of si- silence. This is it's just a full book basically. Oh. So. I don't need you to read a book right now. Yeah, it's HeLa okay. cells were vital in developing polio vaccine, uncovered secrets of cancer viruses, and the effects of the atom bomb. I would imagine they were used in the testing of like the what the effects on it were. I don't. I can't imagine they were put in the actual bomb. No, they were definitely put in a bomb. It's today. pretty obvious what's gonna happen <laughs> to a human at the f- site at the back yeah. of the bomb. I'm gonna be okay with uh, the idea that they were put in a bomb. I'm okay with that. I accept. All right. They were put in a bomb. I mean, just for shits, even. You yeah, know? yeah, it's fine. It's so just fuck around and see what happens. Mm-hmm. Oh, they exploded. <laughs> 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 Test results came back. They exploded. Checks out. All right, what, what happened after they put Just that? as we hypothesized. <laughs> Um, so, yeah, so it was proposed that Hela cells should be regarded as a new species by Lee Van Valen. What? 
it was proposed that HeLa cells should be regarded as a new species by Lee Van Valen. Lee Van Valen. Mm-hmm. Okay. New species? Yes. Their own separate species. But they're human cells. He said that they should be called Helicyton gardleri. Gardleri? I don't know. That's like the scientific name of the species. Um, the argument for speciation depended on the chromosomal incap- incompatibility of HeLa cells with humans, the ecological niche of HeLa cells, their ability to persist and expand well beyond the desires of human cultivators, and HeLa cells can be, or HeLa can be defined as a species as it has its own clonal karyotype. What is that? Dude, did you ever take biology? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, fine. <laughs> The number and visual appearance of the chromosomes in cell nuclei of an organism or species. I don't know why I asked. That was like a foreign language to me. Yeah. Um, But the proposal was not taken seriously by like scientists or really anybody. (laughs) Or me. (laughs) Yeah. Um, But it was because uh, the argument for speciation does not fulfill the criteria for an independent unicellular asexually pre-producing species because of the notorious instability of Gila's karyotype and their lack of strict ancestral descendant lineage. Got it. (sighs) Yeah. So they also hoped with the discovery and establishment of in vitro fertilization, Mm -hmm. which for those of you that don't know, because I had to look that up, it's when you put an egg and a sperm together outside of a human body. Like how it looks why? Like, like, yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's the thirty seconds in you that you understand. That's that's the whole show. The whole show is his life. But that's not all. Did much much more for biomedical research. But that those are the examples that I have. Got it. So now we're gonna get back to Henrietta because that's that's who we're here to talk about. That's what we're here for. So Henrietta Lacks died on October fourth, nineteen fifty one, at thirty one years old. Very tragically. On August 8th, 1951, she went to Johns Hopkins for routine treatment for a routine treatment session and asked to be admitted for continued severe abdominal pain. She received blood transfusions and remained in the hospital until her death in October. And her family was not there with her. Um, they ended up just getting a call and said, like saying that she was dead. But a partial autopsy did show that the cancer had metastasized throughout her entire body. She was buried in an unmarked grave in the family's cemetery in Clover, Virginia, she, which was the um, land that was originally owned by slave-owning members of the Lacks family. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was not clear exactly where she was buried, but it was probably a few free, fr- feet from her mother's grave in the cemetery, which was the only one to have been marked with a tombstone at that time. Why was she marked in an unmarked grave in her family's cemetery? I think that they just all were. Like, her entire family was. It's wild. Yeah. Probably it's too expensive or something. Also, yeah. And they have the land to do it. Put a stick in the ground. Yeah, but they, like, had an actual tomb. I think that they probably had, like, the crosses there, but they were unmarked. Like, it didn't say. I recently looked up how expensive, like, like, it's expensive to, like, just do anything. Like, it's expensive to die. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, my, God, my grandparents are... I don't want to say that they're crazy or weird, but, like, they're old, so they've, like... But for the past, like, ten years, they've been preparing for their deaths. So they've, re- like, written and rewritten and rechecked and, like, gone over their wills just basically since I've been alive. I've just, like, that's a conversation that they've had. And then they also... Um, we had a year of just all of my grandparents' parents dying. So it was, like, one after the other, after the other, after the other. And they all got buried in like close by cemeteries and we my grandma would always take us to they already have bought their plots of well they're they're gonna be like in a mausoleum so she would take us to the mausoleum and show us her like their spots of where they're gonna be just constantly that's weird yeah super weird yeah yeah so anyway that's (laughs) i know my grandparents have that too but i don't know yeah why would you take somebody there like a lot too yeah, <laughs> like yeah not even just, just like once just like 
No, yeah. Let's, like, let's have a Saturday. Let's go see where I'm going to be for the rest of, okay. for all of time. Like, at all of those funerals, we'd seen it a lot. And then we went to go see my great-grandma's, so my grandma's mom's grave on Mother's Day last year. And when we went, she was just like, do you want to go see our mausoleum plots? And we were like, it's Mother's Day, sure. <laughs> I guess we're just going to go to, like, Also, like, want. has it changed? Have no. You, have you upgraded it? <laughs> like, <laughs> has. Did you get some sweet lights? Some new, some new model? Yeah. Inside. Yeah. It is like, yeah, it's a very beautiful cemetery, very beautiful mausoleum. And it's huge. It's one of, I mean, it is the biggest cemetery I've ever been to, but. It's the average huge. cost of a funeral in the U.S. is 7 to 12 grand. Bear me up back. Well, mark the fucking spot. <laughs> no, I, understand, I understand that's what they did, but like, unmarked? Like, come if on. If I bury it back, then they'll find you later and then they'll think I killed you or something. That's. Well, if you mark it, it seems less suspicious. <laughs> it's suspicious. You're like, they... he's right here. <laughs> he's here, it wasn't me. Like, I, I told them. Well, it's less suspicious if they find a body. But like... it's still suspicious. Yeah. But it's it's more reasonable if I. Like, if I went to someone's backyard and I saw. Like... Is that illegal? Probably. It has to be. Right? Yeah. Is it legal to bury your pets in the backyard? I'm not going to answer that one, and I don't think you should look it up. <laughs> I mean, it's not going to change. It's already done, so <laughs> it's not going to change anything. What if you bury in a backyard? Not yours. <laughs> <laughs> Loophole. <laughs> All right. Anyway, All right. Jesus. Anyway, let's go on. Um, in 2010, uh, Roland Patillo, who was... Um, in the movie, he is the person who Rebecca Skloot contacted to get family connections to learn more about Henrietta. Got it. But uh, he was a faculty member of the Morehouse School of Medicine, and he had worked with George Guy and knew the Lax family. Um, he donated a headstone for Henrietta, and uh, after that, the Henry also the Henry, excuse me, the family. <laughs> Henrietta and family. <laughs> the family also raised money for a headstone for Elsie Lax, which was dedicated on the same day. So Elsie is the daughter. The daughter, yeah. Um, Henrietta's headstone was written by her grandchildren, and it reads: Henrietta Lax, August first, nineteen twenty, to October fourth, nineteen fifty one, in loving memory of a phenomenal woman, wife, and mother who touched the lives of many. Here lies Henrietta Lax, Hela. Her immortal cells will continue to help mankind forever. Eternal love and admiration from your family. It's beautiful. In 1996, Morehouse School of Medicine, which is where uh, Roland Patillo worked, held its first annual Gila Women's Health Conference. It was led by physician Roland Patillo, and it was held to give recognition to Henrietta Lacks, her cell line, and the, quote, valuable contribution made by African Americans to medical research and clinical practice. Fuck yeah. The mayor of Atlanta declared the date of the first conference, October 11th, 1996, as Henrietta Lacks Day. In 2010, Johns Hopkins Institute for Clinical and Translational Research established the annual Henrietta Lacks Memorial Lecture Series to honor Henrietta Lacks and the global impact of HeLa cells on medicine and research. During the 2018 lectures, the university announced that they were going to be naming a new building on the campus after Henrietta. It's the least they could do for all the money they made off her. Exactly. Um, in 2010, also, the Henrietta Lacks Foundation was established, which is um, a foundation that I do... In the website, it doesn't say that it was established by Rebecca, but in the movie, she said that she wanted to start one, so I don't know if those, are, if those coincide with each other, but there is yeah. a foundation called the Henrietta Lacks Foundation, and um, I just have a bunch of quotes from their website to tell you exactly what they do, what they're about, so... Their mission statement is, quote, helping individuals who have made important contributions to scientific research without personally benefiting from those contributions, particularly those used in research without their knowledge or consent. The website also states, there are numerous examples of historic research studies conducted on individuals, particularly within minority communities, without their knowledge or consent. The Henrietta Lacks Foundation seeks to provide assistance to individuals and their families who have been directly impacted by such research. It also goes on to say, 
The foundation also seeks to promote public discourse concerning the role that contributions of biological materials play in scientific research and disease prevention, as well as issues related to consent and disparities in access to healthcare and research benefits, particularly for minorities and underdeserved communities. Un underserved, not underdeserved, excuse me. <laughs> underserved. I, was like, I know. Uh, I was like, that's a really fucked up word. <laughs> underserved communities, excuse me. So yeah, so that is what the Henrietta, Henrietta Lacks Foundation does, and the family of Henrietta Lacks has like um, been involved in that and seen benefit from it. Good. In 2011, Morgan State University in Baltimore granted Lacks a posthumous honorary doctorate in public service. Sorry, I was thinking about the word posthumous. It means after they died. No, I know. I know what it means. I just, in my, like, in my brain, I always say it. Posthumous. Because, it's like, post is, like, after. Yeah. But then, yeah. I know that's wrong. Yeah. Anyway. Sorry, I just had a battle with myself mentally. I lost. So do you know what I just said? No. I was stuck on the word. After she died, Morgan State University in Baltimore granted Lax an honorary doctorate in public service. Damn. Yeah. Did I say honorary? Honorary. Honorary. Jesus. Dr. Lax. That's Dr. Lax to you. That's what it should have said on her headstone. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, she is, she is such just a lovely, lovely woman too. And it just is so tragic that she, that nobody knows who she is. Um, in 2011, the Evergreen School District in Vancouver, Washington, named their new high school focused on medical careers the Henrietta Lacks Health and Bioscience High School, becoming the first organization to memorialize her publicly by naming a school in her honor. Fuck yeah. In 2014, Lacks was inducted into the Maryland Women's Hall of Fame. In 2017, a minor planet in the main asteroid belt was named 3594 Two six lacks in her honor. She had a planet named after her. Sick. Um, and 2020 was the centennial of her birth. So again, she was born August 1st, 1920. And uh, there was a hashtag started, hashtag Gila 2020, which was part of a movement to celebrate Henrietta Lacks' life and legacy. Quote, I want scientists to acknowledge that HeLa cells came from an African-American woman who was flesh and blood, who had a family and who had a story, which was also Jerry Lacks Y, who is the granddaughter that quoted above. Mm -hmm. um, in 2020, Lacks was inducted into the National Women's Hall of Fame, which is awesome, fantastic, super great, awesome stuff. Super great, awesome stuff. Uh, and in 2021, the Henrietta Lacks Enhancing Cancer Research Act of 2019 became a law. The law states that the Government Accountability Office must complete a study about barriers to participation that exist in cancer clinical tri trials that are federally funded for populations that have been underrepresented in such trials. Sorry, what was that? It was hard to follow. I'm, I'm, I apologize. The Government Accountability Office must complete a study about barriers to participation that exist in cancer clinical trials that are federally funded for populations that have been underrepresented in such trials. Got it. So they have to do a, like, they basically have to look at what barriers are in place to prevent underrepresented communities from being parts of cancer trials. Got it. Um, and then I do have this closing quote about Henrietta that said, quote, Henrietta Lacks loved to cook, spaghetti was a favorite, and she loved to dance, often, with one of her five children in her arms. She dressed stylishly and wore red nail polish. She was the emotional and psychological center of a home where the extended family gathered and where the door was always open to anyone in need. Which is from the Nature article that I read. It's beautiful. Yeah. She sounds like she was a, a great woman. Yeah. Very much so. And, um, again, I'm just, I would also like you to put this in the... In the ending, this is what she looked like. Love it. Love her. Yeah. Just a moment of silence for her. Yeah. I like it. Wow, that's really interesting. I, yeah, I, I had never heard 
of her existence. But apparently, um, a lot of what her cells went to do um, have benefited all of us for a long time. Yeah, and still do, and still will for yeah. literally probably forever. Probably forever. They're immortal. They're gonna outlive us. They're gonna outlive all of us. That's just true. Like they can survive nukes. They're gonna they're they're gonna survive the nuclear winter. They're gonna they we're all gonna be dead. And her cells will go on to just, you know Party. Find find some mouse cells and just create mice human. Mice mice human mice. Hume mice. Hume mice. My my mymin. My mymin <laughs> hue mice. Gross. Bunch of human mouse mimes. Just miming away. That is a cartoon I could get behind. It sounds gross. Let's do it. Let's not. Anyway, um, yeah, it's amazing. Yeah, very, very, um, I don't know, just interesting and intense. And I just can't, yeah, I cannot believe that I hadn't heard of this before. Um, so if I did leave anything out that was super important to the story, if there are any like super amazing feats that you know that Hela cells were a part of, or if there's anything about Henrietta that you know that um, you just, you know, want people to know, please feel free to email us at hello at mntpodcast.com and feel free to let me know if I got anything wrong there as well. And it's time. It's time for the new thing. Oh, I forgot about this part. Yeah, we got one Did more thing. Bits. We got more. We got a tidbit coming at you. You both felt the wind of that on me. Yeah, this this notebook holds power and knowledge. So much knowledge in this. So, are you ready? I'm ready. Ready to hear some some cold hard facts about some cold hard things. Like my heart. <sighs> no. Like my fart. No. Like nice. Your, like your fart. So. If you watched uh, last week's episode or listened to last week's episode, was it last week or was it two weeks? Brown. I think it was Brown episode. I think it was the one I just edited. We talked about the um, pigeon thing. Yeah. And the and the ravens. So, if you listened to it, you would know what I'm talking about. If not, let's refresh the memory. Um, the initial, I think, thought was uh, between Serge and I talking about Game of Thrones, and we were wondering, uh, like, were ravens a real thing? Like, they always send ravens as, you know, messengers. So I think ravens are a real thing. No, I mean, like, the, the, the <laughs> Is that a real bird? <laughs> Is that a fucking bird? Never heard of it. It's a football team. Never bird of it. Never bird of it. Um, and we were wondering, like, did they really deliver messages? And I was like, that seems a little fantastical, but I do know for a fact that pigeons were used at least in war as messengers which i also had to fact check because i was like i know that but then once i said i know that i was like i don't really know anything so i had to check it it's also really hard to buy that yeah exactly like, like I, I feel like it, like you're like oh yeah obviously like carrier pigeons yeah, it's, duh it's, it's and like, then you like really kind of analyze that exactly so it's like that's a, like a thing i knew for so long or i was like i didn't question and then once i was like i'm gonna say that to an audience i was like I should probably fact check that and make sure I'm not a fucking idiot. They are a real thing. And also, the next part was wondering, like, how they did that. Because I thought it was super impressive, and it's so much less impressive than it. I thought it was. So they just, like, whispered in its ear, and it just, like, went and did the thing? That would be impressive. <laughs> no, it's less than that. So. They just tie a <laughs> string to it and direct it. <laughs> to clear Sorry, to clear the board. Uh, ravens were never used as... Okay, I was going to clarify. Yeah, ravens were actually never used. Um, there are, like, myths and stuff about, uh, ravens, I think, um, being used by, like, Vikings and stuff to find direction and find land and, like, all this other stuff, but that's not messaging and all this stuff, but there's no record or any actual proof that ravens were ever used or crows were ever used for, uh... Crow. Crow. Uh, sending messages just wanted to make that clear um so here's the actual um very unimpressive truth that's trying to carry the pigeons too though 
<laughs> yeah, they sent a pigeon with the messenger as a uh, you know like a like an emotional support animal. Yeah, right. Um, for the messenger. <laughs> so so they saw the pigeon like, oh, he's carrying a message. <laughs> let, let, let him through. <laughs> None of that was true. Oh, okay. um, I was a guess. So, basically, the pigeons were one-way messengers. So what they would what they would do was have a what the fuck um, have a pigeon nest at like say a base or something like one location or like one city wherever they uh, had like a headquarters or something or something. They would have them nest there, so that was their home, and then. They would take that pigeon and travel with it, like, out to, like, war or wherever they are, like, wherever their destination is. Oh. And then they would strap a message to it and let it go, and it would naturally it would go home. home. So it wasn't like they could tell it where to go. So every destination that you had to send a message, which is, like, Serge and I were, like, talking about and laughing about, uh, like, in Game of Thrones, which they did have a lot of ravens. But, like, you would need to have a bird for every place that you want to send a message to be able to send messages there. So you would have to have a shit ton of birds. And if you had a... If you had and a, if you wanted to send more than one message, you had to have duplicates. Mul- multiple yeah. birds for... Yeah, it's... it's So that's pretty... Inefficient. Inc- inefficient, for sure. A lot more so than I thought. I thought, like, you just... You taught pigeons how to, like, know where to go. And, like, you could, be like here, take this message to this person, they would go there? No. That's, that's yeah. horse shit. So, yeah. Well, they, they could, like... They're just flying home. They're not actually delivering a message. They're just going home. Well, you could, like... I don't know, like, like make a pigeon have two nests. You know? Which one would they fly to? Well, if they're at one, you just kind of, like, give it a little kick. <laughs> <laughs> not here, buddy. Go to the other one. <laughs> Yeah, I don't think that, that's definitely not how it worked. Well, obviously. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's 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 the whole thing. Honestly, I I'm that's really glad tidbit. that I know that. I feel like that's a good fun fact for like parties. Yeah, it's a good icebreaker. I also would love to see someone walk into a party and be like, "Hey, you know, messenger pigeons." I'd like to go to a party. I would like to go to a party too. We have, there's parties don't exist anymore. You know, Nick I mean, Thune's joke about do. carrier pigeons. I don't. I don't think so. You know, like if you love something, let it go. If it comes back, it's a carrier pigeon. <laughs> it's funny. <laughs> well, yeah, that makes sense. So I was curious about that, and um, ravens are useless. Pigeons are a little less useless, but they are they still used? No, they're not. I don't, At all. I don't. Does think Mike so. Tyson use them? Had a show. <laughs> no kiss. <laughs> no, no, no. He had a show with pigeons. He had a show with pigeons. Yeah, he had like a whole show where he like raised pigeons, and I think they were carrying pigeons. Well, wouldn't the messages only be able to be sent back to him? Yeah, maybe he likes messages. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> he, he deleted the internet. He doesn't use the internet. No more no, emails. He's off the grid. Pigeons only. Analog. If you have to send me a message, come here, get a pigeon, take it, and then send me <laughs> send the pigeon back. Mike Tyson has never hidden his love for pigeons. The world champion boxer, who netted several hundred million dollars during his career, is known for investing heavily in them. The cost for upkeep of his beloved birds have reached astronomical levels in the past, with him spending over $400,000 a month at one point. A month? (laughs) He owns over a thousand pigeons in New York City. And that costs $400,000 a month? (laughs) He owns pigeons in New York? I guess so. How many pigeons does Mike Tyson have? He currently has 70 pigeons. Wait. Has a he has a coop at his home that houses over seventy pigeons. Yeah. But they're not carriers, they're just pigeons. They're just regular pigeons. Just says that they're just pigeons. How do you fall they in love with pigeons? They could be carriers if you oh, if you true. took one, sure. put a message on it, took it somewhere else, and let it go. Then it would be a carrier. Uh, also, how do you like t- like? I it just like I don't know. Birds freak me out. I like I'm not scared of birds, but just the thought of having well, they to like. Robots, so. Yeah, they definitely work for the bourgeoisie, but the bourgeoisie. <laughs> the bourgeoisie. Oh. Um, yeah. I did not know that Mike Tyson... I think I knew that he had something to do with... Like, he liked pigeons, but I, don't, I, think I didn't know he had a bunch of I pigeons. I didn't know anything about that. I just know there was, like, a show. 
Yeah, but I don't. To answer your question initially, um, I don't think par- carrier pigeons are used anymore. I think they're more efficient ways to send messages now. Um, maybe uh, people that are really into LARPing might use carrier pigeons just to like commit to the the bit. Anything uh, for the bit. Anything for the bit. Um, other than that, no, I, I I don't have any information on on the current usage of. How does it feel? <laughs> Just kidding. At what uh, age can they fly? That I don't know either. When can they travel? How far can they fly? Oh yeah, what is the distance? I don't know that either. You're the one with the laptop. Google it. <laughs> These all seem like very Googleable questions. Just like literally everything you have a question about. Unless yeah. it's just like, yeah, what was her son's middle name? I've never asked that, nor would I care. Anyway. What are Mike Tyson's 70s pigeons', pigeons names? names? He for sure named all of them. 100%. <laughs> no I would way. love to know what he named his he, pigeons. And he knows each and every single one. Oh, yeah, there's no way he doesn't have a name for every single one. He's the sweetest, most terrifying person I've ever met. I know. Met. Didn't he recently return to boxing? Didn't he? He did like a uh, exhibition match, I think. Did he win? I don't know that much. Sick. <laughs> I guess I could Google that. Yeah, but I did see him. Or I saw him on some new thing. Got it. All right. Want to get out of here? Yes. Um, if you are listening on anywhere and not watching on YouTube, you can go watch on YouTube and you can see a very beautiful picture of Henrietta Lacks and um, actually a carrier pigeon right here. Oh, we're going to throw a carrier pigeon in here? No, you were going to throw a carrier pigeon in here. <laughs> All right. And uh, if you are watching on YouTube, feel free to go and listen to us. If you're just going to go live your life out and about in the world and can't sit in front of a screen. Um, we are on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, Google Podcasts, and... Overcast. Um, a whole bunch of things I don't know. We're everywhere. We're all over the place. Yeah. And if they're, like, I think we said this last episode, but if there is somewhere that we aren't that you would like to listen to us, feel free to shoot us an email at hello at mntpodcast.com. Um, and we'll try and get, get on there for you. And, um, if you could very, just pretty please take... I don't know, like 11 seconds out of your day and go to Apple Podcasts if you have an iPhone and give us a five-star rating and maybe a nice little review about how, you know, charming this little Topo Chico plant is. Um, It would be much appreciated. That's five-star worthy right there. I, I agree. Look at these. They're so cute. Yeah. Anyway, um, yeah, please do that. That would that be great, a great help to growing the podcast. And um, if you don't get enough of these uh, big dum dums that we are um, every Monday, you can follow us on Instagram and Twitter at Misfits and Tidbits. Um, we are not even active a little bit on Twitter at this moment. But as soon as it becomes necessary, we'll use it. So we have the at for now, but like, <laughs> like we want to interact with you and see you and all that stuff, which I feel like we do very successfully and efficiently over Instagram. Um, yeah, we're on Instagram definitely. Um, you can see pictures of uh, the new misfit Finn. He he gets a lot of love on there. Finderella. Finderella. Steven. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> And with that said, um, that's the end of today's episode. Thank you for tuning in. And Junie tuning in. Thanks for Junie tuning in. And um, that should be my new like when I when my sign on. Like your anchor, your anchor's sign on, sign off. Yeah. Yeah. That's anyway. pretty good. That's pretty good. All right. Uh, is that everything? Did we cover it all? Cover the end. Yeah, no, I think that's it. I mean, you can visit our website at mntpodcast.com, but, you know. Or don't. Who cares? It's not like I put a lot of work into it or anything. <laughs> it's not like it took me so fucking long to put together and write our bios and take our pictures and... <laughs> <laughs> it's fucking fine. <laughs> Whatever. Okay. I'm done. Let's go. Cut. Cut it. Catch new episodes of Misfits and Tidbits every Monday. Me. <laughs> <laughs>